Today, Stanford students arrive on campus knowing that they have access to top professors, unlimited research opportunities, and the support of an institution which promotes creativity and entrepreneurship. But LGBT students haven't always felt included and visible on our campus. 30 years ago, they lacked the benefits of professional staff, student organizations, and opportunities to connect with out and proud students. Despite institutional and personal barriers, students have claimed a physical and cultural space for themselves on campus, raised awareness about local, national, and international LGBT issues, and pushed the university to allocate resources to meet their needs. From the birth of LGBT student organizations in the late 1960s and early 1970s, to the hiring of professional full-time directors in the late 90s and the first years of the new millennium, students have harnessed their resourcefulness, their pain, and their personal challenges to come out on the farm and create a thriving community. In 2004, as Stanford celebrates 30 years of an organized queer presence in the Firetruck House, this DVD looks back and celebrates the ideas, the struggles, and the sacrifices of each member of the Stanford community who has taken a deep breath, climbed the steep stairs to the second floor of the old Firetruck House, and dared to effect change. I think what made it easier for me to come out and to become ultimately political at Stanford was having around me a group of people who I really respected and who were thoughtful and supportive. Uh, I would not have come out on campus had I not had role models uh, in the way of students and staff. Uh, I would not have come out uh, had I not had a community center to come out into. One of the things that Stanford has definitely um, allowed for me to grow and to develop as a person and to be comfortable with my own identity is that it's provided, provided me with the opportunity to get involved with the queer community. That has gone from only having a couple of students who are visibly out to now having an institutionalized center that is, you know, legitimizing my identity as, uh, as gay and as queer. To me, community is a big uh, part of my life and having the center provides that community for my queer identity. Um, it helps me define who I am. You could always come in and say, oh, I need to hold a meeting there, or we'd love to hold a party there, or an event. And it didn't necessarily have to be queer centered, but it was a place that you felt like you were a part owner in. I mean, it was, you know, it was a place to get my wings. It was a place to learn um, all the difficulties of activism and of um, you know basic event planning and of volunteer coordination um, of running a direct action organizing campaign it's a point of reference for me as I try to be um, an activist out in the real world and to learn what that really means um, it's it's something that I I think about and think about you know basic lessons learned um, about trying to reach out to people, trying to engage diverse constituencies, um, trying to turn your anger into something constructive, um, trying to turn your joy into something constructive. The radicalism of the late 1960s and early 1970s resulted in the emergence of movements on behalf of many historically marginalized communities. Civil rights, feminism, and the early gay rights movement strongly influenced life on college campuses nationwide, as a younger generation began to express itself culturally and politically through a range of radical organizations. At Stanford in the 1960s, the isolation and invisibility experienced by many LGBT students fueled the formation of a series of short-lived gay and lesbian student organizations. After the creation of the Gay People's Union in 1972, students claimed the second floor of the old Firetruck House as their own in 1974, initiating a 30-year residency marked by struggle, perseverance, and celebration. Well, there weren't very many out gay people at Stanford. Um, I was lucky in that I was in a very small program. I was at, in Modern Thought and Literature. I felt very lucky to be less isolated than I would have been in if I were in a different program. But in terms of the larger university, 
it was very isolating. It was mostly that we were invisible. It was mostly that it was a given that it was assumed that you were straight, that no one ever felt particularly safe to talk about their relationships, um, that the books that we taught, the books that we read, the books that um, we were expected to write papers on were all almost entirely about straight existence. So our world was very circumscribed. The world that mattered to us was not considered very important. It was considered very marginal. I began at Stanford in 1972, I blush to say. I was hired as an assistant professor in the biology department, and my subject is ecology and evolution. And I was a very young, one of the youngest assistant professors. When I began here, uh, there was uh, essentially no queer community, and um, diversity of all kinds was completely absent. My situation, you see, was I was, I was living in two worlds. I was, I was living in an out, uh, socialized, uh, uh, gay world in San Francisco with gay friends and going to gay places and so forth and being part of the community that was emerging you know, starting in the 60s and 70s. But I was closeted here at Stanford. It was different. I mean, it was like for people who are familiar with what it's like to be um, gay in the black community, it's sort of like as long as you aren't flaunting it or running around or as long as they feel like you're still black, which is a sort of weird thing to say, but you know, people will sort of ask you to choose. Just like in the gay community, they'll ask you to sort of pick what your identity is. I was pretty outrageous at the time. I had a pair of very faded denim jeans and I had this rainbow double woman symbol uh, embroidered on the pants and I wore them religiously, I wore them very many days, when, especially when I was teaching. I was, I was into being outrageous, and I think partly I was into being outrageous because I felt isolated. There was this course on homosexuality, which I think was pretty brave of Stanford. I mean, it was a student-initiated course, but they let it happen. There was uh, a, a women's poetry festival at which there was some specifically lesbian content. Um, there were a few isolated things, but in terms of support groups or, um, um, say, mental health um, counselors or anything like that, I don't think there was anything specifically geared to gay students at all. There was a small but very active queer community when I arrived at Stanford in uh, the fall of 1979. The what was then called the Old Firehouse was already the headquarters of the organization that at that time was still known as the Gay People's Union. Uh, I remember going probably my first or second week on campus to the Wednesday evening men's social gathering and there were probably 40 people uh, there. It was a mix of students and alumni and community members, uh, a very lively, friendly group. Working out of the old fire truck house, queer and allied students in the 80s continued to educate the Stanford community about what it meant to identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Programs like the Speakers Bureau and Gay Families Day highlighted how personal identity and the coming out process intersected with other notions such as the importance of visibility, community, and empowerment. At the same time, however, the community struggled to adequately address women's issues, racial diversity, and the challenges of HIV and AIDS. Lacking formal institutional resources, students relied on community peer support initiatives to educate the campus about sexual health issues, to challenge discrimination, and to support one another. I think that there really wasn't that much visibility on campus, certainly not as I think there is now. There just weren't that many openly queer folks. You would never see couples um, walking through campus. You never saw anyone holding hands. Um, there were almost never any articles in the newspaper or in the daily. Um, so in that sense, I think that there needed to be a lot more of 
uh, internal support because you wouldn't be getting any sort of visible, visible support you know, in the university. So there was a lot more focus on getting the LGBT speakers bureaus out into the dorms. Um, because again, this was the time when you didn't have Queer as Folk, you didn't have Will and Grace, you didn't have any of those media images. So if you weren't able to get those speakers bureaus into the university, then there'd be a lot of kids that would never actually see any positive LGBT role models. We had the Friday Women's Social, the Friday afternoons, and um, I at, at one point drew the logo for it, which was a double woman symbol with a magic marker, but um, it got the point across. <laughs> and um, there was always somebody called the head lesbian, informally, jokingly called the head lesbian. Um, and it, it changed over time, um, depending on people's energy levels. And I was kind of the head lesbian emeritus. I was, I was sort of over it by then. Mm. But um, yeah, I had been, at, for a while I was the head lesbian and, and tried to get everything organized. And it was always a struggle to get critical mass of, of women to events at the center. For Gay Awareness Week, the week usually wrapped up with a big dance. Uh, okay. Originally, when I got here, they were held at the firehouse on the second floor, but ultimately, uh, we received permission to put on the dances at the commons at, what is it called, Governor's Corner, I guess. And those dances would attract quite enormous crowds. You would see students and staff members there that you would never see at any other event. I first got involved with the queer community here at Stanford back in the late spring, early summer of 1982. I had gone to see a um, Speakers Bureau presentation when I was living at Branner. At the end of my freshman year, I finally um, got up the nerve to call over to the old firehouse and uh, just found out you know, when things were going on, if there would be someone there to meet me. I think I, I first felt like I wasn't quite brave enough to just show up on a, I guess, Wednesday night, which is when they used to have the, the socials. So I set up a time to meet with one of the volunteers just on my own um, and talked to him really briefly. And it was probably my first one-on-one -on -one conversation with this openly gay man. Well, the, this was around the time of Bowers v. Hardwick, which was 86 also. Um, I, th I think people went to the, some of the marches on Washington. Yes. Um, people went to the gay pride parade. People, people were aware of what was going on in the outside community. Um, I also um, started an AIDS, um, a voluntary student organization that provided funding for people to get trained as um, AIDS support volunteers, practical support and emotional support for people with AIDS. There were a range of things that were put on. Of course, we brought in noted speakers. Uh, I remember Armistead Maupin giving uh, an informal talk at the firehouse uh, one year. For two or three years, we put on something called Gay Families Day, which was uh, an, an opportunity to invite gay people, their families, uh, whether their parents or if they had children of their own. Uh, from the broader community, it was held at the Frost Amphitheater. It was a kind of picnic, and then there would be performers and so on. I think it was really just doing more community education and trying to present LGBT students as everyday folks, people that were already living in your dorms, people that could be your teachers. And so I think by the time I left, um, there were a lot more undergraduates and even some freshmen involved. Um, we ended up having uh, more outside entertainers. I, I think when I got here it was just when uh, Marco Gomez was just starting out. So. Marco Gomez and Monica Palacios came to the coffee house to do their acts. Um, this was when I think uh, Romanoff, Romanofsky and Phillips, I think, were, were still big back then. So for Stanford, that was a big step to even have openly queer entertainers um, showing up at the, at the coffee house. In the 1990s, with direct action organizations like ACT UP and Queer Nation setting the tone of national gay politics, the old Fry Truck House became a locus for grassroots activism. In addition to traditionally organized campaigns, 
Guerrilla tactics such as underground chalkings in White Plaza and radical zines promoting LGBT students' rights pushed the university to offer domestic partner benefits for Stanford employees and to host events for LGBT students during new student orientation. Yet, the diversifying effects of activism led students to the realization that no single organization could effectively serve every queer student. As Stanford's student body came to include more people of differing ethnic, racial, national, and religious backgrounds, the LGBT community diversified as well, resulting in the creation of multiple student organizations and campaigns. The Firetruck House, now called the Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Community Center, or LGBCC, became a center of a new polycultural activism which promoted cultural awareness as a response to homophobia on campus and in society at large. Stanford really has been at the forefront of uh, service provision for LGBT students for, for many years. And there are times when it's easy to forget that. On the other hand, um, when you look back at what Stanford, even Stanford was doing in the early 90s, it's, it's a little bit frightening. One of the experiences that was instrumental to me was uh, involvement in a group called Blacks, which was black and queer at Stanford. And I think being comfortable being black and queer has been a long process for me. One of the things I noticed as I tried to integrate my, my black identity and my queer identity was that there was a real perceived hierarchy within the university, um, both at the student level and also, frankly, at the administrative level, that um, it was more important or more urgent to meet uh, my needs as an African American than my needs as a, as a queer student. And of course, my identity doesn't present itself that way and my needs don't present that way. Uh, and that was always frustrating. So I felt like um, I didn't get the kind of support that I would need at the BCSC. And the LGBTCC was dramatically under-resourced to, to support me. We had these nights called be-ins um, and they were held at the, at the Stanford Coffee House. Um, I don't know if they still do them. <laughs> I'm sure that it's sort of, the concept is totally not necessary, but the idea is that, you know, you would, it's sort of a, um, a civil disobedience strategy where we sort of all go and be in, and, you know, the idea, I think it was a, a play on the idea of being out, but we would all be in at the coffee house, um, and so it was like kind of like a queer night at the coffee house, and when I first started going, they felt it was pretty amazing because you just didn't ever see a lot of other queer people out all together in one place um, other than those nights. So they were very powerful. One of the more visible organizations on campus was Queerland, especially in the early 90s. This is around the time that ACT UP and Queer Nation around the, around the country uh, were mobilized around HIV issues, around queer rights issues, and a chapter of Queer Nation, Queerland, uh, started up on campus. And there were stickers for Queerland, all over Tresseter and all over the libraries and a lot of straight students and queer students had the perception that there was this massive, organized, pissed off queer contingent uh, on campus and it turned out that there was really one or two people um, stickering and flyering and trying to raise awareness of LGBT issues. It's incredible the leverage that, uh, that we saw as a result of one person's um, desire to ensure that queer students and queer issues were made visible. You'd wake up in the morning and ride through White Plaza and see that they had chalked White Plaza with a political message about something that was going on on campus, um, in particular around the, the gay liberation statue vandalization. I remember people coming out and standing in vigil around it and putting out candles and flowers. And that was one of the, the moments that I really felt the community coming together um, in the face of the oppression that we were facing on campus from other students. It had been smashed with a hammer and spray painted with the word AIDS and other words had been spray painted on it. And so it was in storage in the basement of the University Art Museum. And there were several people who were art or anthropology grad students who had access to the museum and um, snuck down there one night with cameras and took pictures of the, the statues still um, in their vandalized state after the university had been assuring the daily that they had been repaired they and they would, be re they would be replaced any day now. And, and so they had their, uh, their guerrilla invasion of the Stanford Museum to, to snap pictures. Externally, this was front page news for, for several days uh, after the incident. And I think that that led uh, to a greater recognition that students on campus felt threatened, felt afraid, um, didn't get the kind of support that they really needed. And that upped the ante for the university to start responding in a way that was uh, conscionable.
Uh, we weren't queer in those days. That was before the queer vogue had started. I guess, well, I guess Queer Nation was starting no, up queer around then. Because I remember we walked around with all the little stickers off. Um, yeah, it was just, the queer thing was just getting started. Um, but there were definitely, there was definitely a community that coalesced around the LGBTC, as it was called at that time. And um, there were also many other gay people all over campus in various social groups who were not affiliated with the center at all. So staff groups and there was a staff, staff group, but even less organized. Yeah. I mean, in uh -huh. some of the fraternities and sororities, yes. there were groups of people who knew each other, who didn't know anybody else, who didn't want to know anybody else, who didn't want anyone else to know about them. Um, we did have sort of an orientation for gay students, and was we were mostly staff because at the time I was a staff at Stanford in the early nineties, and. Um, we would go to orientation for the new students and there would be all these people who were really staff or faculty and there would be maybe two or three new students. And by the time I left Stanford, you would go to these orientations, not only they were not put up by staff anymore, they were put up by their, their own, the students that were here before and the kids that were coming in were already out, were already the head of their um, Gay GSA. Straight Alliance in, in their high school, so what's very, very different. The assistant dean of students who was um, assigned to, you know, sort of help be a liaison to the LGBT community um, coordinated a queer graduation event. And the 10 or 11 of us that were in the class of graduates at the time, um, we we all got acknowledged and we were all, um, we all kind of came up to the front of the room and there was a ceremony and um, the assistant dean of students who worked with us gave every one of us a candle um, and, you know, asked us all to keep that candle and light it whenever um, we faced oppression. And I still have my candle and I've burned it a lot of times in the last decade. My experience at Stanford was definitely, that's where I came out and that's where I developed my um, my sort of my political awareness and consciousness um, around oppression, um, sexual and gender oppression, as well as oppression based on race and religion. And um, Stanford was definitely sort of a politicizing experience for me. By the mid-1990s, the LGBCC remained unrecognized by the university as one of the formal community centers in the Dean of Students' office, despite having been a campus presence for over 20 years. Staffed by volunteers, the center became the nexus for all things queer at Stanford, serving as a resource for faculty, staff, and students. A Students Affairs Task Force exploring the needs of LGBT students revealed astonishing discrepancies in resource allocation. Following these findings, students actively pushed the university to create first a half-time, then a full-time paid directorship for the LGBTC. In 1999, their strategies paid off, and ever since then, the LGBTC, renamed the LGBT Community Resources Center in 2001, has worked to simultaneously honor its activist past and nurture an ever-evolving community. When you look back on what was available to students in the mid-90s, um, there were a lot of resources uh, in the way of student groups and student-led activities. There was a support group at the bridge um, that a friend and I ran for a couple of years. And there was a real wealth of opportunity for students, but all of that um, was student-led and student-driven and supported by staff and faculty and administrators to some extent. But uh, there was no sort of coherent program where someone sat down and really determined what is it that students need and how do we provide that in the most effective way possible. And that kind of centralization requires a director who is full-time, really understands community needs, and understands what kind of support should be provided. That's not something that students should do. That's something that really a university has a responsibility to provide. Well, there was, um, there was the space. There was the building. And that was about it. I mean, everything else came from the students. Interestingly, I would say the most noteworthy in my Stanford experience was involvement in a task force that studied queer student needs on campus. It was launched in, I believe, 1991. And I joined at the, in the fall of 91. And um, I joined as the closeted student voice. 
and then over the course of, of that year came out. Um, it was supposed to be studying student needs over the course of a year. At the end of the day, the, the study went on for about five years, resulted in a three or four hundred page document. The report generated uh, a lot of conversation and dialogue, and at the very least a recognition on the part of the administration that it was important to start addressing student needs. Uh, I, I'd like to think that it's as a, re a result of that work and the work of countless other students and staff and faculty and alums, importantly, that contributed to the creation of a position uh, at the center. There was some support from the university, but very sort of, you know, little steps and so there was a lot of hesitation. And um, I took it under the conditions that the university would do its best to do something about the center, to, to come out of it. And there were a lot of angry students, but things worked out well and we were able to to gather support for a full-time position. That was challenging for me at the beginning because I came in really optimistic, really excited, this new person who's like, hey, this is amazing. Here we are at Stanford, all these resources, all these talents, let's go. And people would say to me, no, you don't understand what we've been through over the last two years, three years, five years, 15 years. So that was a bit of a shock for me at the beginning. The Concerned Students for Community Centers was a coalition of the constituents of the six community centers. It was formed at a time of larger scale political change um, within the Stanford student body and particularly Stanford undergraduates. They wanted to give a significant amount of attention to representing students in the important policy discussions um, of the university and perhaps a shift in what was defined as important being things like um, tenure battles, um, the treatment of contract workers at Stanford, um, how resources are distributed to academic departments and how resources, resources are distributed within student affairs and specifically the community centers. There is a community forum which I was interviewed at and I think there's probably 25 people, 25 students that showed up and probably another 5, 10 administrators. And so the sense that I had right off the bat was that people were very invested in what happened with the community. We really wanted to open up the queer community to people, to people of color, also to women. Women had felt that they weren't part of the center. I think that the community around us really opened up because we were reaching out to our other respective communities. It was like a dual belonging and not, you didn't have to belong to the queer community and then lose your ties to the black community per se. It's very easy to not talk about being bisexual, but when there's a place where, where it's, it's just obvious, like you're there and everyone's there and it's okay. Um, it's, you don't even have to talk about it when you're in the center, it's just by being there, it sort of acknowledges a part of you that you wouldn't that wouldn't be heard. If there's one thing that you can say about yourself, if there's one argument that you can make for your equality in this society, it's usually embodied in the name of the community. What are we? Are we, are we eight letters? Are we four letters? Is gay good enough for everybody? Can we be the gay center? Are we the spectrum center? Are we the queer center? Um, what do we want to be? And I think that sexual identity, sexual orientation, and gender identity are very personal things. They're discovered in personal ways. They touch upon our emotions. And so to politicize those and to try to unify those um, in political struggle is hard. Um, and to do so without to unify without losing the value of that diversity is even harder. I was the student coordinator of the name change process and what we really wanted to do is make a space for a trans, the transgender community and so the T was, was absent. There was a lot of contention around just using the word queer, calling it the Queer Community Center, and therefore bypassing the need to try to include every letter um, that you possibly could. I know that some centers right now call the LGBT 
QQI centers, and I'm sure we'll be adding more as our community continues to diversify. CAS is a really unique program. It really changed my um, perspective on freshman year. Um, it had a really big impact in my life freshman year, and I knew that I wanted to work on it again. I wanted to be a part of CASA in some way, and I think it's really a unique opportunity that most freshmen don't get to come and already have a community set up for them um, to be able to meet other queer and questioning frosh um, and hang out and have a space that's um, meant for them, specifically for them. Our greatest memory from this year was the um, closet party at Terra. It was a freshman party, but it attracted graduate students and students from other campuses. And it really tied together the LGBT community in a way that I had no idea freshmen were able to do. I, teaching this freshman seminar on, on gay autobiography, uh, which brought me in touch with you know, 25 or so undergraduates e each year. I've done it, I think I've taught it four times, four different years. And I, you know, I be, that, that gave me an audience. And I actually did teach the class and continue to teach it, not just as a scholarly or intellectual matter, but as a kind of what, public service. I mean, I think of it as being, serving some of the students as a vehicle you know, for working on their own lives and their own personal situations. And it's been, I'm very glad I did it. It's been the sort of the best part of my teaching, maybe the best part of my life in the last uh, four years, because I've met a lot of really interesting people. And I feel I have the f uh, welcome feeling that I've done some of them some good. I would love to see a queer studies program, or even actually better, to see queer aspects in all the traditional disciplines so that actually you would need queer studies because you could do that in history or political science or English or whatever it was. You could find mentors to support that kind of academic work. I think that's vital to what goes on. And so since I think Stanford, since I think of Stanford as being sort of on the cutting edge or forefront of a lot of what goes on in academia, then I think it's important for part of that to be queer. fight for resources and attention to address the needs of LGBT students because LGBT students are under an extraordinary amount of pressure during their time at Stanford. Many are closeted or questioning. They are struggling with an incredibly difficult, arduous developmental process towards self-acceptance and coming out and self-definition and it really impacts their experience at Stanford and mitigates for many people their experience at Stanford. Many students' academic performances suffer because they're so worried and stressed out about their own development, about their own communities. Many students' general well-being plummet while they're struggling with these issues. And I think that we can be doing more to provide resources, sensitive, educated staff, special programs, special resources, better referrals, all those kinds of things in the student services arena I think are really critical. It's essential that alumni get involved. It's essential that alumni of color and that queer alumni be aware of the power that they have to make change at this university. If they um, send messages to administrators, if they let administrators know what they care about, if they stay in touch with students to learn what the important issues are, um, and if they give their money in order to make Stanford um, a better place. 
Well, I think the challenges are more subtle than they used to be, because not all, we're, we're entering a sort of an era where there's very little overt homophobia. Um, I think especially to women, that's my experience. Um, gay men might have a different um, history here. But I think now we're dealing with much subtler issues. We're changing people's minds about what it means to be gay. And um, we're, we're basically, I think, showing other people that, that we're on the same we're on the same level as they are. You know, they don't need to they don't need to think of us as as different than they are really in a lot of ways. And so I think the work that we're doing now is a lot subtler. And we're sort of I feel like um, we should be anti-assimilationists, and I, f I think we are at this on this campus. And so we're sort of teaching people about us. We need to remain active uh, and. I especially feel when talking to undergraduates who are just just uh, coming out that they wish that the battles had already been fought and feel like the battles have already been won and don't quite realize how we still have many battles ahead and and that if you're willing to identify as LGBT in some way that you that commits you to having activism as a place in your life. I know that in some stages of my academic career I definitely felt like the LGBT CRC was the only place that I did belong. It was the only place that when you walked in someone was really cheery and automatically said hello to you and asked you how you were doing. That didn't happen in a lot of other community centers. It didn't happen in your department didn't happen in academic standing. <laughs> Trying to find the right balance between honoring the struggles uh, that people have endured through to get us here, at the same time recognizing, you know, all the things that are working well and how we can continue to grow from, you know, from where we're at. And it's, it is kind of, it is a hard line to, to balance between because, you know, both Ben and I have come here in a time when there's just an abundance of support. Um, as compared to the past, and you know, I've definitely have felt very lucky at how much the university has supported us, and how much the colleagues have supported us, and and the involvement of the students. Um, the level of involvement has been amazing. So, um, it, it's, it would be easy for me to feel that it's always been that way, but of course it hasn't. You know, of course, before I came, there was the struggle for my position, and there's the struggle for Ben's position. There's the struggle for space. There's the struggle for community, for visibility. And so I think that the best thing that we could do to honor that is to keep trying to strive for excellence and keep trying to grow and keep trying to build upon the momentum that, that was already built for us when we stepped in. The LGBT Community Resources Center today boasts two full-time directors, robust funding, and a large student staff. Supported by 12 affiliated voluntary student organizations, it has become the nexus of a strong, legitimate, and visible queer campus community. The focus of Stanford's LGBT community has evolved to incorporate same-sex marriage, attention to social class, and transgender and intersex issues. Yet the themes of the last 30 years, the quest for expanded visibility, the struggle for space, support, and academic opportunities, the challenge of intersecting identities, continue to resonate. Though fashion trends, hairstyles, and music tastes have changed, the goals of the students who make the Firetruck House their on-campus home have by and large remained the same. Their ongoing and passionate efforts, along with those of Stanford's LGBT and allied alumni, faculty, and staff, have created a vocabulary with which to engage the broader campus on queer issues and a strong institutional base from which to take on the diverse challenges faced by queer youth everywhere. As old challenges give way to solutions, and new challenges come into view, the Firetruck House endures as an oasis, a refuge, and a fertile ground for new initiatives in higher education and LGBT activism. Stanford's queer community cannot know what the future holds, but remains confident that it will continue to play a vital role in the evolving struggle for human rights everywhere.